Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. I am very upset not to be able to be with you today. Also because, you know, moments of presence are so precious at this time. So I'm so sorry to have to do a remote connection. But unfortunately, I had a small accident to my eye. And that's why I have to wear dark glasses and I couldn't travel. I'm so sorry I couldn't come to Venice. Anyways, I'm very pleased to be here with you. And I wish to thank the um, representative and organization of this conference. I think it's a fantastic idea to uh, refer to scholars and academics to be able to understand Buddhism and so not only through uh, religious vision, but also through uh, deepening the subjects of Buddhism, exchanging dialogue. I think uh, this is important through study, sources, history, historical contexts. So when uh, Dr. Chiara Mascarello invited me um, to participate to this conference, and the title was The Faces of Contemporary Buddhism. I straight away thought about a face. And e even though he doesn't declare himself Buddhist, from my point of view, Lopon Tenzin Namdak Rinpoche, that I'm going to talk about today, has seemed to me um, one of the most contemporary faces of Buddhism. I met him for the first time in India, in the Dolanji Monastery in the Imachar Pradesh in 1980. I was there to work on my thesis. And the first thing I noticed was that I had met a, a great living teacher of uh, Dharma, his kind smile, his encyclopedic knowledge of any text or tradition of Tibetan Buddhism and born his incredible simplicity and facility in communicating even difficult concept really struck me. His life constantly devoted to the preservation and practice of his religious uh, tradition has something amazing. And in my contributions, I'm going to try and outline his life the life of uh, Yonzin Tenzin Rinpoche from his birth, 1926, in the Kimpo region of the uh, eastern Tibet, to his studies and uh, retreats in Tibet, his tragic escape from uh, Tibet into exile in 1960, his life in diaspora first in Oxford and India, Nepal, where he currently lives in the Bompo uh, Monastery, founded in 1986 in Kathmandu. So it will probably be necessary to give you a short introduction to the Bön tradition. As Professor Donatella Rossi already did an introduction, but I think as Bön is not so well known, I would like to give you and reiterate a short introduction. Maybe I will repeat something that has been said, and possibly from a different point of view. I think it could be useful. So, Bern is one of the religious schools of Tibet and has been uh, considered for centuries a fake <coughs> doctrine from the Orthodox Tibetan tradition, and it was marginalized up to recent times. I think that fundamentally, starting from the great work uh, of uh, Yonzin Tenzin Namdak, and also thanks to the non-sectary vision of the Dalai Lama, recently born found both in Tibet and in the West its place in the uh, Tibetan religious school and has given it contribution to the knowledge of the um, spiritual heritage of Tibet and its potential for a fertile dialogue with the West. But before giving you a picture of this important Lama, I would like to tell you something about Bern. 
it's the autochthon religion of Tibet. So it is a heterodox form of Buddhism. Following uh, the words of one of the first scholars who dealt with Bonn, who in 1961 invited Yonzin Rinpoche to Oxford and studied with him one of the most important texts of the translation, Bonn is the true religion. Snellgrove says in his text in the translation, The Nine Ways of Bonn, uh, it is the one all embrace. Spirit. Western scholars of Tibet persuade an indigenous Tibetan scholar to take any interest in forms of Tibetan literature that lie outside his particular school. Normally, a DG like Gelugpa scholar would be ashamed at the idea of reading a work of any other Tibetan Buddhist order, let alone a Bompo work. Yet, educated Bompo monks clearly have no such inhibitions. They will learn wherever they can and Given time, they will absorb and readapt what they have learned. They have learned. So this is a definition of Bonn. I think it's still quite valid. Since 1967, contemporary studies on Bonn did great uh, steps forward. The scientific bibliography was enriched to the study of Snellgrove, thanks also to the contribution of uh, Namga, who translated a Tibetan text uh, very precisely, is a very important point of reference. Bun is an inclusive tradition, and over the centuries it has changed, uh, adding layers over layers and enriching uh, material uh, that has always uh, renewed itself for the different historical context and also reusing part of the Tibetan literature. In recent times, there was a study by two endologists, Elisa Freske and Philip Maas. The title is Adaptive Reuse, Aspects of Creativity in South Asian Culture History. So. The term they use, flexible reuse, adaptive reuse, so adapting oneself to the historical and literary context, um, had different modulation in literature and Indian philosophy, yet defines fully what happened in the religious born literature over time. Considering the uh, education of this tradition in a diachronic uh, sense, in the same time when Buddhist Tibetan schools started and the Buddhist canons were organized, the Bun school started to take shape, whose doctrines date back to the pre-Buddhist period. According to the tradition, the Bon teachings were conveyed by Sheran Yuwon that is to be found in the Tazik region. And some have identified this with Persia. But according to other sources, the location was the ancient uh, kingdom of Shunjun at the foot of the Kailash mountain. Historical sources, very ancient ones and other documents, do not talk only about one name to define cults and religious beliefs of the indigenous populations pre-Buddhism. In one of the first uh, sources, I am very sorry, but the professor is reading a text that has not been provided to the uh, interpreters at the speed of light. So I'm doing my best. Sorry about that. So the first religion, the smallest religion, Chochum, and Buddhism 
was defined the religion of Buddha or Buddha Dharma, Che Buddha, the good religion, Che Sampo or Che Lampa, the correct religion, Che Yan Tampa, the great religion, Che Chan. Also, the integral version of the Samye institution, which represents the oldest source, does not contain the word burn as a religious tradition, but what is mentioned is a popular religion, Nietzsche, which preceded the introduction of Buddhism in Tibet. So there is a consensus between contemporary academics that in the imperial phase, the first phase of introduction of ancient Buddhism, there is no organized religion called bone. The most ancient sources talk about the bone as a practice of funeral rites, apotropic um, funeral rites, and the bonpo term, kushan, those terms were used to uh, point out to the uh, people who were celebrating these rituals. According to traditional chronology, um, at the base of bonpo there are the terma, the revealed treasures. Shenzhen Lunga, I think you are going to know it's uh, what termas are, uh, which is a literature of revelation. And according to tradition, Shenzhen Lunga started the second propagation of Bern in 1017. After that, Bern was the object of fierce persecution by Buddhists starting from the 8th century. There is a difference between the Buddhist idea and the burn idea of terna or revealed treasure in the ancient uh, Buddhist tradition. Tantra and secret teachings um, had been hidden by Padmasambhava and other um, important religious um, characters because the Times were not mature, according to them. According to tradition, these scriptures uh, were hidden to subtract them to the destruction by the persecutors of Bon. The main, the main part of revealed treasures were hidden um, around the 8th century. In the 11th century, the period of a second uh, propagation of uh, Buddhist uh, um, doctrines, Bern emerges as one of the schools and organized religions, and the Therma were rediscovered and started shaping the first nucleus of the Bern canon. In this period, there is an effort of reconciliation um, with Buddhist traditions, and the figure of Buddha Shakyamuni was considered a manifestation of the founder of the bone religion, Sharanibo, and one of the six Buddhas who uh, lead the six realms of existence. So Bone wants to assimilate and conglomerate all the traditions that were um, circulating in Tibet. And there are also traces at this time of a tradition that could be considered protoburn. Uh, protoburns are at least with some families, some clans, uh, according to which uh, Burn had taken some dichotomic and polarized forms that had developed over the following centuries. Bompo, who had to recreate a non-Buddhist tradition uh, with elements that were very different from uh, the Buddhist tradition that are recognizable as original, primordial, and indigenous, were incorporated together with other elements uh, of center Asian or Chinese origin. The combination of these factors brought to the creation of a literary corpus that is extremely fascinating, uh, rich in elements, 
mm, of different origin, endogen and exogen, with an internal and poetic consistency. This burnt literature, even though it developed at the margins of uh, mainstream schools, had a very important role in the religious history, in intellectual and literary history of Tibet. According to the burn, There are three phases, ancient burn or bonyin, a pre-dynastic era, eternal bone or yundrung bone, the classic bone tradition from the 11th century onwards, and the new bone, bongsar, syncretic movement from the end of the 18th century, very much alive in uh, Eastern Tibet and in the diaspora, which was preceded, as I said before, by eclectic currents of new treasure, Tartsar, starting from the 14th and 15th century. Burn uh, subdivide their doctrines according to two systems, the nine uh, vehicles and the fourth portals plus the treasure. The nine vehicles have a parallel in the Nima tradition, and they are subdivided in three sections. The first four, or six vehicles, of course, are Tajin Tepa, the vehicle of prophecies, which includes rites of divination, astrologic calculations, and diagnosis of illness. Nanchen Tepa, way of the visual world, which includes uh, rituals of white and black magic and the description of spirits, demons, and other deities. Frul Shen Tepa, way of magic, on the magical rites, exorcisms, destruction rites. Exorcism for destroying adverse forms. Sri Chen Tepa, way of life. It talks about funerals and rites um, connected to funerals, such as rituals that protect vital force of human beings. Then there are four other vehicles, the four vehicles of the fruit, Genyen Tekpa, for the uh, lay practitioners that include uh, laws that include ethical laws, the 10 principles of positive actions, of virtuous actions. And then it's followed by Drang Tsrong Tepa, way of ascetics or Svastika Bon, that is focused on ascetic practices and meditation and monastic life. Finally, we have Latkar Tekpa, way of white A, referring to tantric practices and secret mantras, Yeshen Tepa, way of primordial Shen, referred certainly to some technical yogic specification. And then the last vehicle, the supreme way, Bla Med Tepa, the, or the way of Tso Chen, which includes the teachings of Tso Chen or of the great perfection. The other system, the system of the four portals on the fifth is a treasure. Even here, this is a system that includes all of the doctrines, but it is also a different and independent system. This is divided in the portal of the white waters containing fierce mantras that uh, deal with tantric and esoteric practices, especially practices connected with fierce deities, wrathful deities. And then the uh, portal of the black waters, which uh, practices uh, divination, practices funerals, funeral rituals, magic, but also purification um, rituals. 
Then also, there is a third uh, portal, Pan Yurigya Pabum Niban, Bon, sorry, which includes texts that are connected to the Prajna Paramita, so teachings on monastic code and practices and techniques and philosophy of Prajna Paramita. Then there is a burn of the scriptures and the secret oral instructions of the masters, the teachers of Ponce, where um, you will find Dzogchen teachings. And then the last, the treasury, which teaches techniques of Uh, exoteric techniques which include also somehow other techniques contained in the uh, four previous portals. So, as we have observed in the Dzogchen literature, there is also the uh, last vehicle, the last teaching, which is subdivided in three different ways of transmission. A so the 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 three teachings, the uh, teachings of the letter A, which is a current a tradition of texts of Tzogchen, of the letter A, um, Tzogchen itself. And then the teachings of Log Chanjun Yingje, which is the oral transmission of Chanjun. As we have noticed, the burn literature consists of two main literary genres, the Terma, so the treasuries, and the Tantras, which were conveyed and um, uh, orally. So in Bonn, just like in Nima, uh, the terma were criticized in terms of their legitimacy. Uh, and uh, the controversies that came out developed a, a large a controversial literature which uh, fed the debate of the following centuries. According to Bonn chronology, the first discoveries of terma date back to 1913 AD, but in 1917, Shen Shen Luga codified them after revealing many terms and started to create the bone canon. At the beginning of the 15th century, Bonpo had already written many tantric scriptures in the term tradition and the oral tradition of Nyangyur, and the scriptures were included in the first bone canons. The first version of the canon dates back to about uh, 1450, and the first drafting of a catalog of the bone canon was prepared in the first half of the 18th century by Kung Dro Japa, who was born in 1700. So this important Bonpo teacher was the mentor of the king of the Rabtan kingdom who started preparing the lineage for the uh, printing the canon, but uh, most of them were burned by the opposition to the Bon tradition. But these um, molds were um, cut and were sent to central Tibet so that they could be printed. And many other traditions, many other manuscripts that were found in Dihor and Kyungpo monasteries. Two great uh, Western travelers did report to have seen manuscripts of the Bone Canon during their journey in Tibet. The first one was the American scholar Rock, who said he had seen in 1922 a copy of the Bon Canon in the uh, monastery of the district of Tsoso in the uh, southeastern Tibet. And a Russian 
in uh, 1928 found a manuscript in 140 volumes in the monastery of Sharogan in northwestern Tibet. In 1965, the catalogue of Bone Canon was published in India, drafted by the 22nd abbot of the NNG monastery, Nima Tenzin, born in 1913, had been brought by the Bon monk uh, during his escape in Tibet in 1959. According to this catalogue, which was drafted by Kunjol Dapa, the scriptures of Bonpo Kangyu are subdivided in four categories, the Do, the Sutras, 46 volumes, including text on monastic discipline, cosmology, hagiographic literature, uh, for example, the the medium and long uh, biography of Sen Rabmibo and prayers. The boom section in 19 volumes, the 1,000, the 100,000 chants or 100,000 chests, uh, text. Sorry, that corresponds to the Buddhist literature of Prajnaparamita. Then the guild section, the tantras in 40 volumes. That includes the uh, largest part of tantras of the bone tradition. And then Sem, or Jir Treasury, in five volumes, the section including teachings of the Zhou Chen. So the other section, the comments, is subdivided in three categories, the external, section that includes uh, comments relevant to ethic, uh, metaphysic, metaphysics and monastic discipline treaties, uh, tantra, uh, tantric rituals, protections in dharma from the Daki and protections by the dakinis, uh, magical rituals and secret practices and initiations. Uh, we've uh, we've done like a short synthesis to give you an idea of the Bonpo literature, and now we're going to get to the life of Yunzin Tenzin Nandak, who was born in 1925 in Kham, in eastern Tibet, in the region of Kyungpo. In this area, this is a a picture of the birthplace of this Lama. And the first years of his life were characterized by extreme poverty. The father um, was ill with um, leprosy and uh, it was an incurable illness in Tibet and had to abandon his family. The family obviously went to misery. The parents of the mother, who were very rich, called the daughter to her um, home because according to the Tibetan a tradition, if the family is divided, the female children have to go with the mother, but the uh, male children have to stay with the father. So Yonzin Rinpoche was abandoned in the family where the father died, which was a really poor family, and no one could take care of him. So the, um, you know, the, the, the subsistence was with a uh, being a shepherd. So he had to be a shepherd completely abandoned. He, and when he was nine, he had to go back and be a shepherd for the family. In his biography, uh, there is a touching episode when at nine years of age, uh, dirty, malnourished, uh, and uh, met his mother, who was crying to see him like that. And after this meeting and other sad moments, uh, uh, and we are in the 1930s, um, and also the uh, conflicts with Chinese um, um, army and the uh, central Tibetan government. He went to his mother family and started studying painting to become a tanka painter, apprenticeship which brought him to complete the uh, frescoes of the Nanjal temple in the monastery of Yunjung. 
in 1937, he started, this is a, a map of contemporary Tibet. I don't know if you can see it, but here there is a monastery of Kimpo Chen Chen in Kham. So he went to the monastery of Kyungpo Teng Chen and started studying at the time. His teacher was Gatrul Tsewan, a very strict lama who put him under hard discipline. He had to chant melodies, uh, play ritual instruments, religious dances, and studied philosophy in the monastery of Menji. In that time, 1942 42, he helped his painter uh, uncle to paint frescoes in Yundrungling Monastery, and in 42 started a long pilgrimage towards the sacred places of Bun, going in a very many um, sacred places in Nepal, all the way to the Kailash Mountain, which is a sacred uh, mountain. For Bun as well. So let's take a look at this picture. Questo è quando fu ordinato monaco, questa è un'immagine antica di quando lui aveva. So this is an ancient image of when he was a bit older than 17. So he uh, undertook this long journey, went back to eastern Tibet and asked to become a disciple of a great Bunpo Tita, one of the most venerable teachers of the Bon uh, tradition, who was Gunru Tritsing Yang Tsen, great Dzogchen practitioner, who was living in a cave in the Gyerudo monastery. He had taught for 18 years in the monastery of Yundrungling, but had decided to abandon the monastery, retreat. Uh, in a cave and devote himself to solitary retreat. And so wasn't accepting any disciples. So the story is a bit similar to the Milarepa story. Lopon Tenzinandak went to the teacher and started asking for teachings, but this teacher didn't want to give him the teachings. He had decided to never have any contacts with other human beings, with other disciples. But the devotion and determination of Young Tsen Rinpoche prevailed, and the teacher welcomed him as a disciple. But he had to paint for him. It taught him many things because he asked uh, uh, to paint for other monasteries. And as Yansin was painting, he taught him grammar, Sanskrit, liturgy, but mainly the Dzogchen teachings. This master was in retreat. Um, he was in retreat in the darkness, just like the Dzogchen teachings uh, say. Uh, he had to spend long periods in the dark. But even though he was in the dark, during some hours of his retreat, he was devoting himself to teach to Lupin. I call him Lupin because this is the way he was called when I met him in Dolanji, the great teacher Yonzin Rinpoche. So at this point, Yonzin Rinpoche went on retreat and stayed in this um, cave for uh, nearly four years in retreat. After, after a long time, after these four years in the Lang Chen cave in Gerudo, these were very important here for his religious training, he started a long meditation and practice training and went after this period, 
went back to the Menri monastery and became a geshe, studying with Lopon Sangye Tenzing, another teacher of great importance uh, in, the, um, in his spiritual um, and academic education. In 1952, at the age of 27, he became a geshe and became a teacher. He started a very intensive life of studies, practice, teaching. But one of the most important things of his activity is that he gathered texts of the burnt tradition that often were hidden um, in monasteries. They were underground. Uh, they had been uh, treated carelessly. So one of his main activities was precisely to have uh, gathered uh, uh, and bringing to the West during the diaspora, so helping reprinting and circulating all these texts. The uh, great literary burn heritage. In 1957, Conflict was open, and the Chinese army had taken many monasteries, including Manri. So he decided to travel to be able to find some donation to keep his monastery alive and get more burned texts, and went to the Bompo Sajip Monastery near the uh, Dan Ra sacred lake. This is a teacher of the Menri Monastery, Lopon Sangya Stenzin, who followed him in the diaspora and also went to Dolanji, where he died in 1987. So he went to the Saiji Monastery. where he stayed for two years by alternating um, solitary retreat to teaching, teachings. I found many ancient manuscripts with an important cosmology written, tre treaty written by Rab Chetzen and an ancient version of a Magyu um, text, the Mother Tantra of the Bon. This uh, political situation with the Chinese uh, worsened. I, we know that uh, at the time uh, Dalai Lama had already escaped towards India. The liberation Chinese army had reached the Menri and Seji monasteries and started the campaign of political re-education. And young Zin Rinpoche decided to escape. During his escape, he was um, wounded he had a very hard time fleeing from Tibet, risked his life many times, had to stop because uh, he was wounded, nearly wounded to death. But, however, he still managed to escape and get to Nepal uh, in Pokhara with different texts and manuscripts, for example, the precious uh, Shanju Nyenja and other Bompo texts. Once in Pokhara, his activity to search Bompo texts continued because uh, there were so many small monasteries with libraries where even recently Bon texts have been found, texts that have been maintained to be, um, to have disappeared, sorry. so. Um, this is Pokhara with the Sherpa, Sherpa Pazang, who was the Sherpa of David Snellgrove, and he asked to meet up with his famous bone teacher, who had just arrived. And at the time, there were other famous um, exponents of bone who had arrived from the diaspora here for Tibetologists. This is an important figure, Santian Karme, who had arrived at the time 
the abbot of the Menry Monastery and Sangya Tenzin, the abbot, Lopon Tenzin Nandak, who at the time uh, was preparing together with the others to leave for the West. And at the time, in his biography, it is said that the Dalai Lama had just met in Delhi, and he had not met with Yonzin Rinpoche yet and said, please stop here, develop the bone tradition, which is an important tradition for our culture. And you notice that Thanks to the ecumenic vision of Dalai Lama, Bern found its place in the Tibetan religious schools because since the beginning, he was asked to develop the Bern tradition, but also to circulate it and safeguard it. The Lopan replied to the Dalai Lama that he had already promised his snell grove to go to Oxford, and so he decided to leave anyways. During his journey, as we said before, he worked extensively with snell grove. He learned English really well, a very high standard of English, and even went to a Benedictine monastery because he was very curious to know uh, Christian monks. And so they were very important years for his education and his curiosity and his knowledge of the Western world. He decided to go back, as he promised the Dalai Lama to, and went back to 1964. From 1964 to 67, he tried to help the bump of the diaspora to keep the burn community alive. In 67, with the financial assistance of the Catholic Relief Service, he bought uh, some land uh, in Dolangi near Solan in the Imashar Pradesh in northwestern India. This is a photo that shows that uh, he created a school for young uh, people, young monks, uh, young burn monks, so a bone monastery in which curriculum there is also the study of debate, philosophical uh, debate. Uh, this picture shows Lopon teaching debate to the monks, so the um, philosophic dialectics. And this has been something in Gelupa and Sakyapa schools as well. So the education is very strict, very strict academic uh, training on debate. And this work. This extensive work of publishing texts started. He published hundreds of texts in his life. The monastery became a center of teaching for the monks coming from Tibet and Nepal. In 1987, the dialectics school is set up. And in 80, sorry, the speaker corrects herself, 78, the dialectic school in 86, the first Geshe's came out of the school. In 87, he also founds the monastery of Trita Norbutse in the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal. Now, this is one of the most important Bompo uh, monasteries of the diaspora in the 1980s. Goes back to Tibet and starts to reintroduce teachings of the burn tradition, which after the terrible 
years of invasion and cultural revolution were abandoned. So in the 1980, there is a possibility to reintroduce in the teachings and the monasteries the teachings of the Bon translation. And he does this with a lot of, um, of zeal. It's very important that the monks that are formed in the um, in his monastery, the monastery they founded in Dolanji and Kathmandu, and formed many monks. They then went back to Tibet and started training other monks. So in Bompo monasteries of Tibet. Politico. Nel Well, this is a beautiful picture and shows uh, how many monks uh, go to these monasteries for training. He also devoted not only to training Tibetans and training of uh, Tibetans in the diaspora in Tibet, but he also taught uh, uh, Burnett to Westerners uh, with some skepticism. I basically believe uh, that this Rinpoche is a master that is very in line with tradition. And so for him, it's very important uh, that those who decide uh, to study and practice burn do so in a very serious manner. So the curricula that he offers also to Westerners are very strict, implying long months of retreats and study. This is a picture of when he met his mother. After 45 years, he met his mother again once he went back to Tibet. So he found it schools in France and in the United States. So a lot of monasteries and many burn teaching centers were set up. But what is really impressive is that this is considered to be a Tibetan Buddhism school in all respects with the support of the Dalai Lama. I took up a lot of uh, uh, time, sorry, more than the time allotted to me, so thank you for your patience.